Good evening. You're watching the Digital Age. You know, Norm Perlstein was editor-in-chief of the Time, Inc. magazine group. And in that capacity, he was very involved with the famous Miller and Cooper source cases. And we have him here tonight because he's written a book about it. And that book is called Off the Record. I'm going to show it up to the camera. And there we go. Norm, what I want to talk to you about tonight is this. Are reporters' notes sacred uh, in the digital age? So let me just start off, if I may, uh, with Matt Cooper. Now, remember Matt Cooper. He was a reporter for uh, Time Magazine, but he actually uh, reported on the leak about Libby and the CIA, et cetera, without going into the details, online, which makes it a good subject for this show. Now, uh, Matt Cooper's notes were turned over by you to the government and they disclosed the sources. So let's start this way, if I may. What was Matt Cooper's reaction uh, to what you did? And if he didn't like it, why didn't he like it? Um, well, Matt had different reactions at different times. Um, there were times when he was actually hoping we would seek a waiver from Carl Rove and was upset with his counsel, uh, or Time Inc.'s counsel, for not uh, wanting to go in that direction. Uh, in late June of 2005, after the Supreme Court denied our petition to hear the case for why we should be able to keep our, our sources information um, uh, out of the public eye and keep it away from the grand jury, and I made the decision to turn it over, uh, the notes. Matt felt that um, his own credibility as a journalist would be compromised if he were perceived as someone who was turning notes over to the prosecution and willing to testify because he um, believed that his source was confidential and he believed that um, a reporter's duty is to protect a confidential source and if that means going to jail, so be it. Uh, did you consider uh, holding on to the notes yourself? Sure, without doubt. Um, and I think it goes to the heart of your question. Um, Matt, if Matt Cooper and I were the only two people who had his notes, um, I think that as a matter of individual um, conscience, uh, that the right to engage in civil disobedience in the face of a civil contempt case is something that any reporter and editor uh, can and should be willing to do in protecting a confidential source. Um, I had myriad problems with this particular case, uh, not the least of which was that although Matt was asserting that Rove was a confidential source, Matt had put Rove's name into emails, and those emails had been seen by uh, several editors and a couple dozen people at Time, Inc., including people in the IDT department, had access to them. So in the digital age, you might as well think that the E in email stands for evidence because it is in increasingly difficult to protect your notes and protect your sources if you put them in emails or have them on computers. Um, just as the New York Times has found it very hard to protect phone records um, in this age when government can get access to them from phone companies, it is very hard to protect sources. Uh, that was not the only reason I turned over the notes, but the fact that um, so many people had access to it was frankly one of the reasons that Time Inc. was held in contempt, whereas the New York Times was not. Um, Judy Miller's notes were in a shopping bag under her desk and nobody even knew <laughs> that they existed, let alone uh, were they, um, if you will, a part of the digital record. You remember, or I'll refresh your recollection, as lawyers say, and you were a uh, lawyer once, but for the audience uh, uh, I sake, have a law degree. You have a law degree, I should I say, right? I cast a couple bars, but I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> okay. Uh, but to bring the audience into this uh, piece of history, uh, there was a time not so long ago in terms of the wide sweep of history, but in fact it was a, dec uh, a generation ago, when the Washington Post and the New York Times were involved in a case uh, with Spiro Agnew and his lawyer wanted the notes that related to his uh, 
litigation, shall we call it, with respect to the Justice Department. And the uh, Washington Post reporters gave their notes to, to, to Gay Garam, and the New York Times uh, lawyers gave, uh, not lawyers, but reporters gave their notes to Punch Salzberger. And basically, the two of them, that's to say the two publishers, threw the gauntlet down and said, you know, if this is such a big deal, come and get us. Because if uh, you're going to hold anyone in contempt, you're going to hold me in contempt. I'm the chief officer of this corporation, and the notes belong to the corporation. Now, is that a day and age gone? Well, that's the so-called gray-haired widow defense, I think, as Ben Bradley called it. Um, oh, the old gray lady defense. Oh, the old gray, gray lady <laughs> defense. Uh, you know, can you imagine Catherine Graham being carted off to jail and so forth? Um, I don't think it's, it's necessarily gone. Um, again, uh, the distinction I'm making is between notes that are held by um, a journalist, an editor, a, a publisher, if you will, and notes that are part of a digital record that can be obtained by subpoenaing 40 people. It's one thing for Catherine Graham or uh, Punch Solzberger to say, come and get us. It's another thing to tell um, a junior IT person with access to those records in the digital age, hey, we'd really like you to go to jail, um, even though all you are is the custodian of, of this file. And I, that's, I think that's a significant distinction, and I think that's one of the things that, that's very different about uh, the Spiro Agnew period. Um, if I recall correctly as well, and I, I think it's also true in, in the Watergate case, that Agnew, uh, Agnew's efforts, that was part of his, his criminal defense at that time, or? or it was not? part of his criminal, okay. it was part well, of his course. criminal defense, but whether but it, it was, was an indictment, I, think, I can't I remember. don't think there was an indictment, and I think yeah, it was, I a, think it was, an, it was an It was an, invest, an yeah. investigatory yeah. period, which is a little bit different um, from when the Supreme Court denies your cert petition. And in fact, um, as resolute as Sulzberger and Graham were at that period, um, uh, certainly if you look at the Pentagon Papers as another example, uh, Sulzberger gave no indication that uh, in the face of a Supreme Court decision he would behave the same way. Uh, in the uh, Pentagon Papers case, it was one of the very first uh, reporters' privileged subpoena cases. Uh, the government subpoenaed the uh, papers right. from the New York Times because they wanted to see the fingerprints. That's right. Because the fingerprints would lead them to, to the source. And uh, there wasn't a lot of law at that time. It's, strangely enough, there have about, probably been six or seven hundred cases, including yours, since yeah. the Pentagon Papers but that case. Was new. And, but at that point in time, the New York Times uh, said effectively, uh, in a manner similar to the defense of giving the papers to the old gray lady, yeah. that uh, they weren't going to turn them over. Well, and no, that's, yes, that's. They, they weren't, they weren't right. going to turn them over. And, uh, they uh, went and argued the case, and the judge, who was Gerfine, sat on the decision. He never, he never, he never decided it. And um, one time, uh, I heard him ask, answer the question, "Well, why didn't you decide the question?" Because I knew the New York Times was never going to hand them over. Right. Now, is there a lesson in that? Well, I think there are a couple of things in. Uh I would actually love your reaction to this because you were so much a part of that case and I'm just uh, a, a, a reader about the history. Um, the Times did say they would not turn over the papers because of the fingerprints. On the other hand, and we, we need to make it clear, um, what the government was trying to do was restrain publication. They were not, uh, at that point, demanding um, the notes, nor were they um, Demand, demanding the name of the source. Uh, this was about an effort to restrain publication. And in fact, on the front page of the New York Times, Arthur Sulzberger said if the Supreme Court ruled against them, which they didn't in this very important case, he would stop publishing the series on the Watergate Papers. So he, to me, the takeaway from that was um, at least with regard to a Supreme Court decision, he was not about to defy the court. Um, with regard to the notes, it's an interesting question because although you and Floyd Abrams and the editors at the New York I'm Times. I'm just a talk show host. No, you're a, <laughs> you're a key player in this. You are one of the people in the vanguard of keeping reporters out of jail, 
for 35 years and you've been spectacularly successful at it. But in this particular case, Dan Ellsberg was not a confidential source. And um, I think that now, with the benefit of hindsight and what we've learned in the years since that case, I don't think journalists or publications can unilaterally make a source confidential who doesn't want to be. He wanted to be anonymous. He didn't want his name in the paper. He didn't care about his fingerprints. He knew the FBI were, uh, knew he was the leaker and that they were going to come after him. He was prepared to go to jail and had the plumbers not broken into his psychiatrist's office. He, he not only uh, he was indicted, but he probably would have been convicted and gone to jail. Well, uh, I think everyone thought who was involved then, uh, speaking that, as a participant, sure. uh, that he was, he was a confident. confidential and source. And, and because, Sheehan you know, when you, get, when you get into these uh, cases, I mean, you're not a reporter anymore. You were a reporter right. once. I never had the pleasure of being one. So you're always a, a step away, and Correct. you have to take the information that you get, uh, it seems to me, in all probability, with respect to how somebody characterizes what information that reporter has received. And if the reporter tells you that it's confidential, uh, my experience has been you probably have to say it's confidential. Now, in your book, yeah. uh, I think that it's fair to say that Matt Cooper thought it was confidential, uh, but that when you stopped to think about it and parse it right. around, you came to the conclusion it wasn't. Well, but why does your judgment control over his if he thinks it's confidential? Uh, how can we step back later right. and say it wasn't? Well, I think the problem is this. It's um, here, well, first of all, if you will, you had two clients. You had Matt Cooper and you had Time Inc. And those um, those issues ought to be congruent, but they are not always. But secondly, um, more importantly, the real problem was that we never had that conversation. We never had that talk. You and you and neither Matt. Fl neither Floyd Abrams and Matt nor Matt and and I never had that conversation. Well, that's not Matt's fault. That's correct. And what I'm, I, one of the things I say in the book is that I, I was late to figure all this out. Um, I am not wanting to say to you that I was the font of all wisdom. I had not really focused on confidential source. I'd done a lot of libel cases and I understood libel. I really hadn't thought a whole lot about issues involving privilege and about confidentiality. Um, I viewed Frankly, whether it was an anonymous source or a confidential source, my feeling is you litigate like hell to, to keep that source either anonymous or confidential. And it's really only when you get to a point where you've pursued every legal remedy and failed that you have to make these kinds of hard decisions. Um, my problem with the case looking backward is that the day we got the subpoena, it seems to me um, our counsel and Matt should have had a sit down with the editors and said, look, Let's go through this thing and figure out what what were the ground rules. Um, uh, the day you get the subpoena, in a way, it's not unlike a criminal uh, defense attorney doing a workup. And the first thing you sit down, you say, "Well, Matt, what did uh, Carl Rove say to you?" And and you say, "Well, Carl Rove it was a 90-second conversation. Carl Rove said it's on deep background. Well, what's deep background mean? Deep background means." You can't attribute it to him by name. You can't attribute it to a White House official. But you can use the information. You can confirm it in other ways, or you can say it on your own. OK, but what does that mean that he wanted anonymity or confidentiality? Well, Rove and I never discussed it. And then you would say, in May of 2004, not in June of 2005, you'd say, well, why don't we give Rove's lawyer a call and say to him, um, you know, we've gotten this subpoena, and Matt had this conversation with Rove on deep background, and does Carl Rove consider this to be a confidential conversation? Now, what I think uh, the lawyers in there might well have said, and with some good reason, is, hey, you can't do that, because if you do that, by its very nature, you are it's coercive. You're putting the source on the spot, and it's not fair to go to him and ask that. And I guess what I would say as well, if we didn't get the terms right in the first place, when before we wrote the story, now that we've got the subpoena, you know, Carl Rove is not some unsuspecting factory worker telling you about a rivet that wasn't put in. This is the chief strategist, the president of the United States. He's a pretty sophisticated guy with a lawyer named Bob Luskin, who's even as sophisticated as he is. 
call up Bob Luskin and say what was the nature. Because in fact, what Karl Rove says now, and which I believe to be true, is he didn't really think of himself as confidential. He sure as hell wanted anonymity. And he didn't want us blabbing in the, in the magazine about who was the source. But in fact, we caused him a ton of trouble by not going to the grand jury and testifying. Commentary? Please. I really think that um, your uh, law training and, of course, the reporters look at the uh, editors sometimes as the enemy. And your, uh, your training as, as an editor is coming through in full force because I think that perhaps you may have lost sight. Can I say the days you were a reporter? But you're going to tell me we're wrong because I was never a reporter. But yeah, here's, you're, you're wrong but, because you were never a reporter. Yeah, that's you're right. right. Okay, right. But here, here's my point. I think uh, there's a lot to be said that when you're bang, 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 uh, gathering news on hot stories uh, and you call somebody to find out what the story is and I've been on the other end of that phone and you should you, have been. You don't you sit down you and monetize have your source. You can't, geez, you can't. Yeah, you, but you're Jim, gonna, you're gonna, but you're Jim. gonna protect me. You, you can't say, this is, you, they do no. say deep brand, off, off the record, right. uh, anonymous. Da, da. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, you notice you. But Jim, let's also say since you were never a reporter uh, and it, uh, if this seems um, um, <laughs> pejorative on my <laughs> part, it's intentional. Um, hardly any time, any place, anywhere do you finish a 90-second interview and put your story out on the wire. That's not how it works. Matt Cooper interviewed Carl Rove on July, uh, July 10th of 2003. The piece that went out on the website went out on July 17th. Be, now, with the ben this is not a criticism of Matt because I think Matt was doing what reporters typically do. You know, especially if you're a political reporter, not an investigative reporter. When you're when you're interviewing somebody, you're not saying, "Well, how am I going to handle this when the Supreme Court denies our cert petition to protect?" It's just yeah. not that doesn't well, that's come up. So, that's my point. That's of really, course yeah. not. So in the ninety in ninety seconds, you're lucky as hell to get Carl Rove on. Uh, on the phone at all, let alone to get a comment from. Even for Time Magazine, that's a big deal. Let, let's be clear about that. On the other hand, you've had seven days to prepare this story. You've talked, to, you've had 50 exchanges with your editors about it. You've gotten a, a second source who more or less corroborates it in Scooter Libby. All Scooter says is I've heard those rumors too. Um, and knowing what I know now about the how difficult it is to protect your sources, given the way the courts are going, given the way recent decisions have undermined all the work that you did over a long period of time, Some. I would say, well... No, no don't argue. Don't okay. argue. <laughs> I would say before you go on the, on the air, before you go online, before you go in print, you go back to your source and say, okay, this is what I plan to use. Let's understand the ground rules and what we meant by deep background. I don't know about you because uh, I don't know how often you give interviews, but I not only get interviews, but I give interviews. And I can't tell you how many times people say to me, um, or I say to them, let's discuss the ground rules. And then I say, okay, let's talk on deep background. And then I invariably say, if you're going to use anything from this, come back and let's discuss the sourcing and the ground rules. It, it would neither be unusual or inappropriate in that six day period to go back to Rove or Rove's office and say, let's get an understanding of what the source relationship is. Okay, let's is. just turn this around and see if I can tighten the screw on you a little bit more. Isn't it true in the real world of being an editor, a, can I call you a corporate editor? You're an editor of well, many... Well, I read every story in Time magazine yeah, before But you've I got a press. zillion, you've got a zillion magazines. 154. That, yeah, and it's a big, it's lots of money. Uh, you're working in, right, I mean the gross revenues from these magazines. Correct. Uh, yeah. Uh, you're working in a huge multi-billion dollar corporation. Is it really realistic to think that in that environment, you can do what you might want to do, forgetting all the particulars of the facts here, and that is fight for the reporter's life to the end. Can, Absolutely. Can you really do that? You can do it better than you can in a small publication that doesn't have the resources to defend itself. And I think our record of spending money in litigation 
over uh, the entire time I was editor-in-chief and, and continues to spend money. I mean, just last week, an Indonesian court um, fined Time magazine $106 million for an article about corruption in Suharto. Uh, we but that's just money. What I'm trying to get at is, let's, 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 excuse me for interrupting, but I, I want to just narrow this a little bit uh, because I'll take your answer. Sure. But in this particular case, uh, at some point in time, if you decided to go in contempt, which you decided not to do for the reasons you stated, that has to be brought to the attention of, exactly how that is brought to the attention of, you can argue about, and the particulars don't make any difference for the purpose of my question. And that, that board is going to have to make some sort of judgment, even formally or informally. And here's the point I would like to make. I don't think the board would have backed you. Well, first of all, if you're talking civil contempt, I would not have had to go to the board. Um, in October of 2004, uh, I did tell Dick Parsons that this case was coming up, and my presumption was the Court of Appeals would turn us down, we'd, our petition would be not denied by the Supreme Court, and that Matt Cooper would go to jail and we would pay fines, and he signed off on that. So your assertion, I think, uh, reflects suggestions about the evil nature of multimedia company that, again... Well, I'm not saying it's different. Well, I'm just saying to you that you're wrong. Um, I think that, if anything, I had a level of editorial independence at Time, Inc. that was unlike any that I've ever had, any place I have ever worked. And had I decided this was the case in which we were going to take a civil contempt citation, um, the board wouldn't have been a, it wouldn't have been a board issue. Now, where that changes is had it gone to criminal contempt. Which it could have. And if it were criminal contempt... Well, then that was part of the risk, too, wasn't it? It, it's, uh, it certainly was part of the risk, yeah. absolutely. It wasn't... I, I had made up my mind that if the court turned down our, um, our petition, I was going to turn over the notes before I understood about the potential of criminal contempt and the risks involved with that. That was part of my later education. <laughs> but if, if you're held in criminal contempt and you work for a publicly held company, most certainly you would need a board resolution and almost most certainly the board would not give it to you, at which time you as an editor can either fold or you can go to jail and you can quit. And I think those are the options available to you. And they're pretty stark and that's why I think it is critically important that journalists understand that when they grant confidentiality to the source, they're not just putting themselves on the line, but they're putting their publication on the line as well. That's not a bad thing, but it's got to be understood, and most journalists don't understand it. In 1978, there was a case at the New York Times Myron called, Farber. called Farber. Correct. And uh, Farber refused to turn over his notes about a doctor who was murdering his Correct. patients. And uh, uh, he was held in contempt. And he the was. New York Times had uh, material relevant to what Farber turned over. New York Times decided not to turn over uh, its material. It was held in contempt. Correct. Now, in interviews following uh, the decision you made in, uh, with respect to Cooper, you said, had you been in, at the New York Times in 1978, you would not have made the decision the New York Times did. I think I said it was a very tough case in which I don't know what I would have done, but that I'm with the benefit of hindsight, um, it, is, it was not as clear a decision to me as it was to the New York Times. And part of the reason for that was that, at least in reading Farber's book, um, what he said was, first of all, the material that he had in his notes was not relevant to the case. Secondly, that the defense counsel knew who all of his sources were and knew what the sources had said. And third, that this was a decision where Abe Rosenthal had decided, presumably with your enthusiastic approval, that as a matter of principle, we're going to send Farber off to jail and pay fines. And um, I'm, I'm a great believer in principle, but I'm also a great believer in trying to keep my staff out of jail. And so when I look back on the case, and you know, keep in mind, um, the alleged murders had taken place 10 to 11 years prior to the publication of the articles. Um, it was unclear to me what that principle was, who was being defended, what the information was. So, absent. Well, what kind of, what, excuse me for interrupting, but what, what kind of case would you ask your corporation effectively or. Dana Priest's coverage of the CIA detention centers uh, that won a Pulitzer for the Washington Post is is a clear and obvious one uh, that um, I would say, 
not only would I ask the corporation if we were held in contempt, but I would say, look, we're in the media business, and shareholders understand that if you're in the media business, um, your credibility is all that counts. And in fact, it could be bad for the corporation if we were to turn over the notes in this case because it would undermine our credibility and our ability to do the job. And I see no particular financial risk to the corporation. And even if I did, I wouldn't think it important against this case because it was a case that was clearly in the public interest. It was a clearly a case where the sources um, were putting uh, livelihood, reputation, maybe even lives on the line. To well, your bottom, your bottom line may be, you know, once we go through the various uh, approaches, can I call it that way, or sure. con conditions uh, that you would examine, uh, having the editor look at it, what you would look at, yeah. uh, so forth and so on. The bottom line may be, with respect to your view, generally speaking, is that there might be just a narrow uh, group of cases in which it's really worth fighting. No, my narrow view is one that I've understood for a while, but which most journalists do not. And if I'm going to go on a jihad for it, it is that there is a significant difference between an anonymous source and a confidential source. Do you think they'll agree with you on that? Some. The Many? Smart, the smart ones will. But you went, down, you went down to the Washington Bureau, you tried it out in your Washington Bureau, well, and they didn't buy it. Well, it's now a part of the Time Inc. guidelines, which Michael Duffy wrote. So um, <laughs> I think they've seen the light. Um, look. The part of it is, I think, whether you're anonymous or confidential, you litigate like hell to defend it. Because I think a non-confidential information, uh, if somebody doesn't want their name in the paper, that's as important as uh, saying, um, I, want, I don't want you to testify before a grand jury. I mean, in the, look at Armitage and look at Bob Woodward. Woodward calls up Armitage after this whole investigation has gone on in the, in the summer of 2003 and says, hey, I think you were the, the source of this leak about Valerie Plame and Armitage. It, no, wait, let me just finish. I know you love to interrupt. Um, just give me one second. No, I just, we're coming to the end of the program. That's oh, all. even better. So here's the deal. <laughs> Find something else to cut out. Armitage says, I am willing for you to go to the grand jury, but I don't want you to tell people I was the source. That's exactly the con what he did with Novak. Everybody's saying, what's with Novak? What's with Novak? Novak was got an, a waiver of confidentiality, but not of anonymity. And if you do anything in the rest of your life as a great First Amendment lawyer, you should come to my position about the difference between anonymity and confidentiality. All right, but then I will, but we've come to the end, and as a great First Amendment lawyer, I've got to ask you the question. Are reporters' notes sacred in the digital age? Yes or no, because we're totally out of time. The answer is no, they're not, because they've never been sacred. And that's it. Hey, thank no, you. thanks very much thank for you. coming by. Okay, great. And Terrific. thank you for coming by. And come by next week and learn more about the digital age. For the digital age, I am James Goodale. Good night.